Good morning everybody and happy Sabbath to everyone. It's so nice to praise God for all the good things that he has done for us. And uh, as everybody is isolated at home, our homes have become sanctuaries. So let's worship and praise God from our home sanctuaries. Uh, for our first song, let's all uh, sing hymn number 626. 6 to 6. In a little while, we are going home. Let us sing.
1093 fill my cup lord share a few Bible texts for you to meditate upon. The first one is Proverbs chapter 30 verse 5. It says, Every word of God proves pure. He is a shield to all who come to him for protection. The next one is Proverbs chapter 16 verse 20. It says, He who dwells wisely and heeds God's word and counsel shall find good and whoever leans on, trusted, and is confident in the Lord, happy, blessed, and fortunate is he. And the last one is 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. It says, For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. That is why it is through him that we utter our Amen to God for his glory. Jesus is the promise I need to hold on to. He is our sheep and we can take refuge in him. With this wonderful thought, I welcome each one of you to Sabbath School Worship. Let's all bow down heads for the opening prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, creator of this world, on this beautiful Sabbath morning, Lord, we come to thy presence, Lord, thanking you for all the blessings of life that thou showered upon us. Lord, we want to thank you for being a savior, sustainer, redeemer, Father. Lord, we want to thank you for the Sabbath day that you have set aside for us, in which we can sing song and send our prayers to you, O Lord. At this time, I pray for our church members worshiping you, Father, on this day. And I pray for all those people all across the world who are observing Sabbath day, Father. Be with them, bless them. Lord, at this time, in the midst of pandemic, Father, 
I pray for all those people who are infected with this dangerous virus, Lord. You are a greatest physician, Lord. Touch them with your healing touch and heal them and restore them to normal health and strength, Lord. Father, I also pray for our medical teams, Father. I pray for our doctors and nurses, Father. Please enable them with your strength and power as they attend the sick ones and others to stay healthy, Father. At this time, I pray for our great nation, Father. I pray for the leadership, Father. Father, grant our national leaders and local leaders with wisdom and understanding, Lord, as they establish and implement guidelines, Father, as they take measures and make strategies fighting this COVID-19, Father. Be with each one of them, Father. At this time, Father, we thank Thee for all Your wonderful promises that You have made for us, Father. Father, we thank Thee for Your promise that You are not going to leave us, not forsake us in this difficult situation, Father. Thank You once again for all Your wonderful promises, Father, because Your promises strengthen our faith in You, Father. Father, at this time, we submit all our problems and difficulties, Father, in Your hands, Father. Lord, be with us. Keep, uh, protect us and keep us under your wings always. I ask this prayer in thy precious name. Amen. Good morning. Happy Sabbath to one and all. I hope everyone is safe and secure in this current situation by the grace of God. The title of the mission story today is A Shirt to Talk About. This story is about Glenn Lee, who is a 55-year-old teacher at Ostmarka SDA school with about 100 students in grade 1 to 10 in Oslo, Norway. This person is also a member and a former youth pastor of the Beetle SDA church. In 2017, the part of 13th Sabbath School offering was given to them to open Youth Community Center. One fine morning, as Glenn wore his favorite green t-shirt and boarded the subway train in Oslo, he sat across an elegant dressed woman who appeared to be in her 60s. The woman glanced at him, then his shirt. Her eyes remained on his shirt, embroidered the left side, were the words, Advent Airlines, Steward Glenn Lee, and the image of a jet plane. Glenn said nothing he knew the woman was wondering why she had never heard about advent airlines after staring for about five minutes the woman spoke excuse me she said to glenn i haven't heard about this airlines before do you work there and Glenn said, yes. Oh, she said, where do you fly? Glenn said, we only have one destination. Oh, really? She said with surprise. She didn't ask for the destination and even Glenn did not volunteer it. After a long moment, the woman asked, is it very expensive? No, the tickets are free, Glenn said. After hearing this, the woman was confused and didn't understand. She said, why are the tickets free? Glenn paused for some time. The woman's curiosity grew. Finally, Glenn spoke. The tickets are free because they were paid before 2000 years ago, he said to her. The woman looked puzzled for a moment. Suddenly, 
understanding flashed in her eyes. I understand, she said. She paused for some time and said, I have hard time believing in heaven, she said. And Glenn said, why is it so? It was a story Glenn had heard many times about people who rejected the Christianity because of what they saw as a poor example of Christians. Now, Norway is highly secularized society and church members have declined in many denominations for decades. The SDA church is no exception and its 4,500 members have struggled to make inroads in the Scandinavian country of 5.3 million people. So now let's go back to Glenn and the woman. Okay. As Glenn sensed that the woman longed for something better, Glenn said, maybe you will find your way by exploring the Bible with your own new eyes. Hearing this, the woman visibly relaxed and spoke to Glenn for another 20 minutes, asking him questions and doubts regarding the Bible. Then the woman stood up to get down the train. She said, thank you for your talk. You have given me a lot to think about. I will have to do some research. Glenn said, surely you will find your way and he meant it. This was the reason why Glenn always wore his green favorite t-shirt. Glenn dons the short sleeve shirt often as he can. When he does, the shirt draws stairs. Sometimes the stairs leads to conversations. Glenn says, I'm not a bold person. I don't go out to ring bells. That is something I am not comfortable with. But he does love Jesus and wants to be involved in gospel outreach. He also loves airplanes. So he had made this t-shirt from a clothing company in Germany on request. He says, if I can be a tool to help people to reconnect with God, that would be great. Glenn doesn't know whether anyone has been drawn to Jesus or the Adventist message because of his shirt, but he is convinced that the Holy Spirit can use his t-shirt to start the conversation. He says, let's meet people where they are at. My job is not to make anyone Adventist. That is the job of the Holy Spirit. Our job is to sow and God will take care of the reaping. Yes, this is, the, this is true. Wherever we go or wherever we are, we need to sow the seed of Holy Spirit. A Holy Spirit can work through us too to draw the people to him. Thank you and have a blessed Sabbath day. God bless you all. Good morning and a happy Sabbath to all of you. For our feature talk this morning, I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about the promises of God. Uh, you know, as we go through life, we come across different situations. There are good situations, there are bad situations. And especially at a time like this, uh, when the world is going through such a difficult uh, phase, uh, there are so many people who have questions, they have uh, doubts, there is anxiety, there is fear. And uh, generally people don't have hope. Uh, 
uh, and comfort and but at a time like this uh, as Christians we should have hope we should have peace and we should have assurance that uh, God is in control of our lives and of uh, the whole world these difficult situations will come to everybody whether they are uh, good or bad because in Matthew chapter 5 verse 45 uh, God says he sends the rain on the just and the unjust as well so trials come to everybody regardless of who we are but as Christians God has given us such assurances in his word and uh, we can find hope and comfort uh, through the word of God our God is a God of hope and comfort uh, I'd like to read a verse which is found in 2nd Corinthians chapter 5 uh, sorry chapter 1 verse 3 and it reads blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of mercies and God of all comfort all sufferings may not necessarily be accidents they could also be um, ways that God is trying to take our attention or to teach us something so as we go through these trials we should also realize that along with the trials God has also promised that he will never leave us nor forsake us and he has given us so many assurances and his uh, promises that are recorded in the Bible but the question is how do we make these promises real in our life I like to go th through three steps of how we can make these promises real in our life step number one is we need to search the scriptures how will we know what promises God has in store for us unless we seek the scriptures and know what he has promised us um, so the first step is we need to seek the second step is we need to ask in prayer uh, I'd like to read 2nd Corinthians chapter 1 verse 20 and it reads for all promises are yes in Jesus Christ so God makes these promises to us and the key to claiming these promises is through Jesus Christ if we ask anything through the hope that Jesus will uh, fulfill these promises for us these will be fulfilled in our life God never breaks his promises and we can have confidence and assurance that whatever we ask in the name of Jesus Christ he will uh, grant to us and the third step is we need to share these promises with others as we receive uh, fulfillment of God's promises in our life we should also share it with others the sharing with others will build our faith and uh, it's also uh, you know based on the divine principle of God that we should receive to give so as we receive hope and comfort through the promises of God we should uh, share it with others so I would urge our dear church members that don't be discouraged uh, when you go through these difficult times don't be disheartened uh, sometimes you may not see the promises of God being fulfilled in your life but uh, don't be disheartened you should continue your walk with Jesus in seeking his promises in uh, asking them in prayer and one day you will find uh, fulfillment of God's promises in your life thank you and God bless you when the weight of the world begins to fall when the name of Jesus I will call for I know my God is in control purpose is unshakable Doesn't matter what I feel Doesn't matter what I see My hope will always be And your promises to me Now I'm casting out all fear For your love has set me free My hope will always be 
Good morning and a happy Sabbath to all of you. A warm welcome to two of my friends over here, Anups and Wala. Thank you for joining me for this uh, session of a Sabbath School discussion. Well, we are going through our topic. It's a continuation of what was done last week, creation and Genesis. We are looking at the different things involved here and it is a continuation of what almost happened last week. We have uh, top, the first I would say 11 chapters speaking about the foundation of the creation, the scriptures, the major doctrines involved in our Bible, the Godhead, creation, the plan of salvation, the flood, the covenant, the distribution of languages, genealogy, and the power of God's word which was there. Uh, and the nature of man and related, related things to, towards that. All of these have been part and parcel of what has been going on. We are just in the business of continuing from where we left off last week. Well, before we begin, shall we have a word of prayer? Laura, can you listen to prayer? Our Heavenly Father in Heaven, thank you for the Sabbath you have given to us and thank you for creating this world and we are part of that creation. We pray as we turn the 
pages of the Holy Scriptures, enlighten us with your word, and we'll be able to follow what you've given to us in your scriptures. Bless each one of us and all the viewers who are listening. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Our text for this week is on Psalm 19.1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Now, when you look at this particular text, what really comes to your mind? What are anything that comes to your mind based on this text and what's happening around us right now? There's a creator and he creates the world. And it is basically simple. If you have faith, you believe in creation and God created the world. All right. Anups, anything to add to that? You know, a created being always looks up at the creator. So when we read the first portion where it says the heaven declares the glory of God, you know, it's acknowledging that God was the creator. Why I'm saying this is later on, we'll come to the thought and discussion where people today are questioning whether he is the creator or not. Well, that's nice to begin with because we have at the beginning, like you said, a God, a God who's there. It, even when you take the first verse, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, in the beginning, God. It's a very powerful statement. It's a statement of, I would say, faith, if you look at it. Very powerful statement to begin the, the scriptures with the Bible with. And I guess we are going to look into what Genesis offers and what science is going to offer. And look at these two things because what happens ultimately is Genesis talks for God and science tends to differ from this point of view. Now when you look at all of these things, man has been involved in every part of the life to the beginning there. So much of man has gotten so much involved that he's got onto the thing where he's followed the question where Satan puts a question. Did God really say that? That question has been put in man's mind and it has raised different theories. Maybe, uh, or probably you can just share with us something about the, uh, the cosmic side of it. What exactly would that portion of thing relate to our life, of, uh, having God here with us? You mean to say the Cosmology, the cosmic effect. Basically, the study of that, how does it come? Yes. It's, it's very interesting. Um, I, I was trying to get the def definition of cosmology and I've written it down here. And according to NASA, according to NASA, it says the definition of cosmology is the scientific study of the large scale properties of the universe as a whole. Now, I'm not sure how many understood this, but in simple it says the science of the origin and development of the universe. True. And some go further and say it is a branch of astronomy that involves origin and evolution of the universe from the beginning to today. And then we come to the Big Bang Theory also. Okay. So cosmology and... Uh, the scriptures are they interrelated? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and we have different scientists from the past to the latest who just passed away recently Stephen Hawking, from Copernicus to Stephen Hawking. They had different views of cosmology and it has evolved it has evolved and what will happen 50 years from now 100 years from now if the world lasts we are not sure but there has been a gradual evolution of people's perspective of the universe okay. but the biblical perspective is the same 
Right. Maybe in line with this, we have uh, different theories coming up from the 19th century onwards. I guess it's one of the problems we have is we tend to think out of the box. And there's one person who really thought out of the box, if I'm not mistaken, it's Darwin. Probably, Anush, you can share something of a little bit. I, I wouldn't say exactly what is theory, but in relation to that. Yeah, uh, you know, we're talking about science and creation. You know, exactly like what I said in the beginning, many scientists in the beginning, they based and they, they believed that whatever they were studying, it was, you know, it was connected to the creation. Okay. Okay, but later on, somehow the other science and creation began to, you know, make distance. Like creation was there and science was here, separation. And that's where we see Charles Darwin coming, where he popularized what is known as the origin of species. Okay. And, uh, you know, means, uh, he practically began to say that things evolved. You know, originally they were something small and they evolved to becoming bigger, bigger. In fact, you know very well, sometimes they've called our uh, ancestors monkeys. You know, none of us want to be called that we are descendant of monkeys, but it comes down to that. But then, um, Okay, so that, that's where we are now. And like what what I said, you know, even this theology, the way of thinking, the philosophy, sorry, the philosophy is changing, it's evolving. It's taking a change. 50 years from now, what the thought will be, what the thought process will be, another scientist must come, might come up and put another uh, philosophy and the world will start believing that too. When you, when you really look at all of these things, somehow it seems like there has been an attack on that first verse, the Bible, in the beginning God. God has become a source of conflict. When you look at it, it's God on one side, science on the other side. When science comes up, they tend to question God. It looks like there's always been that kind of a thing because I, I, I just kind of assume sometimes that a scientist thinks he knows more than God. Now we've had scientists come and say that we are capable of cloning a person, creating a person. They literally are putting themselves in the, in the, in the shoes of God, I would say. They're claiming to be that. And that tends to kind of create a different thought process in a man, in a man. I don't know what you think about it because it kind of makes you, well, one of the things, like I said earlier, think out of the box. It's a frightening statement. God has given us a, a pattern and we tend to go beyond that. And then we have these controversies slowly coming up, different opinions, which there are people to follow it. There are people willing to follow it. It gets a little difficult, yes. yes. It's very interesting. Because the very first verse in Genesis says, In the beginning God created heavens and the earth. No questions asked. It's a statement that is, has to be taken. No science is involved. Take it by faith. Interesting, it says God created, but people are questioning that man created God. I mean, uh, we tend to take it upon ourselves. Yeah. Uh, in fact, they say God doesn't exist. There is one line. That, of that is the other line of thought. Yes, the extreme other example. You know, you were uh, in your remarks. You made that they were trying to take the place of God. You know, that word used in the scriptures is usurping His place. Mm -hmm. And we know what. Right in the beginning, even before the world was created, someone tried that. He wanted to place himself in power with God and uh, sin began. Well, you know, when you look at it, that particular verse is being attacked. Yes. And the basis of it is, yes, like you mentioned, 
before the earth was formed, before everything happened, there was this man who was creating a problem. The devil was creating this problem. The other day, my daughter kind of just asked me a question. Well, I just going through the lesson. She said, why did the wise man follow a star? It made me think also a little bit like, yes, there's something involved in that, all of this. So they followed a star. And they, they came to find Jesus. It's Maybe it's God's own way of doing things. And they came from the East. Now, East was famous for its own uh, set of uh, religions. Also, yeah. Now, they say like Asia and I had all, all these things before that. The questions are there. How did it happen? But God does his own things. He does in a, in a miraculous way. It's a mysterious way. Yeah. The scripture even tells us that it's God who created the sun, moon and the stars. And they were placed there so that they can control, you know, the seasons and things like that. So probably it was prophesied also that a star would come out from the thing. And the people were studying that. And that is why the wise men followed the star. They were studying the scriptures and I'm sure they found something like that. Like the stars. And they followed that. Well, that, that not be that's an interesting theory actually. It's quite interesting because... Why God allowed that that kind of a process to come into the Bible also? That kind of a thing where somebody from somewhere else came following a star. But God didn't allow it. He had let that thing go through. You know, one of the problems with uh, man, they tend to go into a deeper study of that. And if they can prove it, it's fine. Now the Bible, people have come up with a lot of questions about it. They kind of wonder what is this? Is there something of this nature around? One of the things we had is when you look, let's put ourselves maybe a thousand years back. If you're on this earth, a thousand, two thousand years back, probably way back. You look and you see the end, the horizon. What comes to your mind? What really comes to your mind if you see the horizon? Is it like just one end and you fall, you fall off that edge that was the belief you look at the sun also the sun comes over and just falls off there probably just falls uh, some stories where they fell into the sea and uh, there were problems in the sea with that but that theory that the earth was flat was there in the beginning now would you think that the Bible had something to do with that or the Bible? You know, the title of our uh, lesson quarterly itself is How to Interpret Scripture. Sure. Now, no doubt, these people who came with that idea of the flat earth, they base this discussion, especially on Revelation 7 1. Uh, Let's just read what it says, 11, uh, Revelation 7, 1. It says, After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. You know, this scripture itself tells, gives you an idea that... Uh, the world is flat. It has four corners because if it was a sphere like what we say now, it's a sphere. sphere. Where does the corner come there? Okay. It also is mentioned in Revelation later on, in Revelation uh, 27 and 8. It talks again about the four corners. And so they interpret it in that way. And that's why today we have asked how to interpret the scripture. Do we also start believing that it's a flat? Literal meaning. Ah, literal meaning. But then, the answer to this thing is, Revelation is a prophetic book. Correct? It's a, it reveals something. And they say that Revelation is written in a figurative speech, not direct. Right. Okay. Okay? 
And so we discovered there are many writings over there. Like if you take it for literal, then you will be seeing all sorts of uh, weird animals and you'll be seeing a lot of weird things happening. That's the way Revelation is written. Just to make people understand what it really is. So it is figurative. It's mentioned there figurative because to prove this point that it's not a flat earth, you know, you can read that in uh, Job 26, 7 through 10, if you can uh, read that. Yeah. Job chapter 26, verse 7 states, He stretches out the north over empty space. He hangs the earth on nothing. He binds up the water in his thick clouds, yet the clouds are not broken under it. He covers the face of his throne and spreads his cloud over it. He drew a circular horizon on the face of the waters okay. at the boundary of light and darkness. You see that? A circle. It mentions over there, even in Isaiah 40, when we read verses uh, 22. 21 22. and 22. Yeah. Okay, in the 22nd verse it says, it is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. Okay. Grasshoppers are coming to India. <laughs> <laughs> who like stretches me. out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Now, see the language, what is written here and what's in Revelation. Revelation is figurative, here is practically almost static, because he illiterate. Okay, just a question. Why would Job actually come up with this kind of an idea? I mean, to explain this. Why would Job think about it? Because if you look in the beginning chapters of Job, he kind of speaks like he has seen a vision, he's seen certain things which God has shown to him. So I guess he has some background to this and he comes up with this kind of a theory. But let me put this thing up. I'm a little surprised that we got this kind of a, a portion of our lesson. When you talk about this, it kind of, yes, it proves that yes, science and God, there is a conflict. There's conflict in this. And this was there in the beginning. And somehow people have ten, tended to misuse that the verse is there. Now, it does not necessarily mean, like you said, what is there, the four corners, that means it's a square or something like the, the other side of it is, you look, you have the uh, globe, north, south, where is east, where is west, how far is east, how far is west. You kind of go in circles. Like if it was a flat earth, you would know where the east ended yes. and where the west ended. But then... Over here, like, you can keep questioning where does the East end or where does the West begin. And I think when you read that, it talks almost like it's a sphere. It's like a circle. So, and I think uh, Isaiah 40 also talks of him sitting on this thing. It's, even if you look at that, you get a question about that. Somebody sitting on top of a sphere, it's something like this. You have the Jeff Atlas holding the whole earth up. I think the old cycles used to have that logo on the Atlas cycles. Something like, is it that kind of a thing that he sits on top? It probably means that he has the whole thing in his view, under his control. It just probably means that. But it's very interesting to note that Greek philosophers, 5th century BC, itself told the earth is a circle. Yeah. Okay. Fifth century BC. And they're pretty smart guys, philosophers, who said earth is not flat. It is circular, spherical moon. And if, if they, at fifth century BC, if their knowledge was so much of wisdom, and uh, they're proving that the earth, earth is a circle, not a square. Recently, we have uh, spaceships, we have satellites, 
we have astronauts going out into the space, looking down below, and then they see it's not a square, but a sphere. So it, it proves that the world is circular. And lunar eclipse also yes. proves. Okay. Oh, one thing is just, uh, let's go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Just a little uh, thought there. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. What do you think was that? What's that statement meant? Formless. I, I don't know. I, it just kind of gives me a picture like it was just probably a lump of whatever material there. See, this is uh, before creation. Yes, before creation. After creation, you see, it the world shape. was beautiful. It took shape. Yeah, it took. So, this is before creation. And after creation. Mm. Well, if you look at, uh, okay, look at all of these things. They tend to have a question. Now, one question is this: Man always has been the kind of person who looks to prove something, look at something. Like you said, fifth century BC, people have been talking about it. Now we have people talking about the creation, the creation process. They have talked about it. They say. There's ancient literature which has some uh, input about creation. And we have Genesis which talks about creation, God doing it. Do you see anything either identical or different from that? Because you know, you have the uh, what you call the Atrahasis epic talking about it. When you look at that, what does it give you a picture? When you look at that, the first thing which comes to my mind is God. Yes. The questioning the existence of God. God at the beginning. Because it's it's God in the first yeah. in talk. Okay, the God. When you look at the Atra has his epic, they're talking of gods. Many gods. And here it's just talk. So it's God. God was the, the Holy Spirit was over the face of the earth in the beginning it was dark. He spoke. And in fact, in the first one, it says, God created the heavens and the earth. It's like from nothing, something came up. He just created that thing. It never specifies anything, but he did that thing. But here, these people have their own versions. How would we look at that? How would that be proved? Uh, how would we, I mean, what could we tell somebody who looks at this? See, according to Atra Hassis, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, Atra Hassis means exceedingly wise. But the history is written on clay tablets. History of Atra Hassis, written clay tablets, and it mentions that it's myth. Okay. It mentions, now, two things that comes to our mind. Number one, it talks about creation. Creation is a myth, according to them. And also, one of the uh, things it talks about is the flood, story of the yes. flood. That is also a myth. So, would you want to believe in the myth of Atlantis or in the creation of God? Well, you look at the Atlantis. What they talk about is gods fighting among themselves. You know, I don't, I cannot accept a, a, a concept where there are gods fighting among themselves. H how do you look at the god who's there, who's fighting? You know, here again the devil is at work. I see. You know why? The character of God is what God is. Love. Love. Okay. Now this particular. Uh, myth, this particular way of thinking, it shows that their gods were not a god of love. In fact, when you find out about how they made uh, human beings, it was out of blood, it was out of killing somebody, it was out of violence, things like that. That's so, so, Satan is using this particular thing to go against God's nature. To make us believe that no, you know, as usual, he has attacked his God's character, saying that uh, he's not a God of love. 
truth. Even when you look at this, Satan has also used the sun and the moon, the creation, as for some other purpose. Now, what do you think of that when he takes that into just, user? Just getting into what uh, Pastor Anup said, you know, th these uh, Atra Hasis, Satan has used them to divert our thinking and create another illusion of creation. Because we'll go a little into depth of this. They are all Sumerian gods. They told they were Sumerian gods of the sky, earth, and water. Okay? And they killed another god. Imagine, interesting. They killed another god and a, a goddess by the name of Mamri. She made uh, some kind of uh, figurine out of clay and used the flesh and blood of a single god who they killed and some kind of a womb was created and after 10 months man was born and, <laughs> yeah yes so you see how satan is trying to divert god's creation and dilute that but we need to be uh, very careful not believing the myths and sticking to the scriptures. Well, what happens also is, like you said, Satan has been diverting attention, okay, from from what is created to the crea uh, from from what is the created to the created created being, the created things. Now the sun, the moon, the stars have become. Uh, sometimes you feel that it's basically people looking at something, you know, which is kind of a, a solid thing like, okay, sun rises every day, it sets every day. Yes, it's a good thing for us. Let's worship the sun. The river is water. Let's worship that. In, in the Egyptian times, they worshiped the sun god, the river god, frogs, name it, they worship all that. When the plagues came, they attacked all of those things. God attacked those things through Moses. Everything out there. And it kind of, the, the Red Sea experience also was recorded. In fact, recently the people have found out exactly where the Israelites crossed over with because they found remains. So that means uh, what God has said in the scriptures has been there, is true and has uh, gone through. All those questions which people come up with saying that, did this happen? The Satan's question, did this happen? So, no, it doesn't stay there. It, it just keeps going. Well, the pagans, paganism also is God's way of diverting all of these things. He has brought things like you said, divert man's tension. Look away from it. Where, where it is not there, look for something there. Just keep your mind occupied. Just keep your mind occupied. And all of these people add to that thing. Now, the biblical creation has been at under problems right from the beginning. That time also is a problem. Now also is under problem. What do you think is the basis for all of this? Like you said, probably it's a god. Yeah, a god of love who's been there. I would go a little further in this. Like what right in the beginning you have been discussing, and in fact the whole discussion was on Gen uh, Genesis one one. In the beginning, God. What did he do? He created heaven and the earth. And as we go through the creation, we see that he created the sun, moon and stars. Now, you all stopped. In paganism, we see people worshipping not the creator, but the created. Again, something has come somewhat, something has come into their mind. Why should we look up at God? He's not even there. See, the faith is disturbed again. They wanted something concrete. In fact, the Israelites also, when they went to... True. Yeah. They also began to ask for a God who can dwell among them. Whom they can see. Whom they can see, whom they can feel, who can be in them. God said, I am with you always. His presence was there. There. But still they wanted something. Something more concrete there. So, that's how paganism how is used to attack... God, that after all, He wasn't a creator. Maybe they 
to attack the Genesis, so to say. The events of Genesis. What do you think about the creation of man? What will you look at it there? When you, when you take this into consideration, what people talk, what the Atta has as talks, mm -hmm. and what we talk in the creation of man, when you look at it, how would you compare with what Atta has talks and what God talks of it in the Bible, what Moses really puts it? <laughs> I would not want to believe Atra has this, what he says. I agree, killing, I agree. Killing a god to create somebody and the gods, spit, the gods, three gods, sky, earth, and the waters spit on a figure and made of flesh and blood. Mm. And it's absurd to me. And I don't want to believe in such kind of a myth. And it's a myth, it's sure. not a reality. But don't you think, uh, okay, when the Bible says, when God created man, it was more a personal thing. Yes. A very personal thing. He exactly. created in his own image, yeah. he sure. says. Yes. Which means it was thought earlier. He had a plan. He had a plan to make man, you know, for his pleasure, for his pleasure. But here we see this was this man was human being in the past. We may say it was created as an afterthought. True. True. Yeah, I like it. Like in Genesis 1 26, it says. Let us make man in our own image, in our own likeness. That's amazing. God wants us to be like him, in his image, in his likeness. And, uh, and we are the crowning act of the creation. Of creation. Absolutely. Because the, the uh, concept of him forming us with his own hands, the concept of him breathing life into us. Everything is a literally a personal thing. God created man for his glory also. God held them all, put them all within the Garden of Eden because he wanted them to be there. His character was shown in that whole concept of creation of man. God's character was shown there. God is a God of order. Exactly. And orderliness. And everything falls in place. He created and his crowning act was man. And everything before him was given to man. Take care of it. It's all yours. You know? And Ellen G. White tells in one of her letters, God could have created the world in just one day. Yes, exactly. One day. He could have said and it would have been done. But he took time. It's a thought process, like Pastor Lutheran said. It's a thought process. He planned everything so meticulously and derived at this seven-day week. I, I like that thought because in the Genesis 1, he says he created. And after that, it was like he spoke. And it was done. And he found it good. And so after every day, he said it was good. It was, it was good. good. So, you know, it was, he had a personal involvement in the whole thing. Everything about it was he was personally involved. He knew it, he liked it, and he kept it there for him. Even the Atlas talks about God creating. Why? Because they want man to do their work. Yeah. To but escape work. Escape work. But here, God never did this. God, this is for his glory, basically. He created man. His purpose, all, all of his creation was for himself. Now, when you look at God, when you look at him and... Uh, when you look at the creation and look at the time factor and the whole thing, that is the another source of conflict. People have raised issues about it. Is the creation there? Has it happened? Is it this way? Has it run that way? Where the people involved? When you look at the time concept, there are people involved in all processes. Moses has very nicely put it in two chapters of the Bible, the genealogies he's put, mm -hmm. to show that yes, there were people involved in this in this process. Moses has done that. And if you look at uh, even, uh, you go to Matthew, Matthew also talks about the same thing. The first chapter of Matthew, it gives a genealogy. It talks about Abraham to David, David to Babylon, Babylon to Christ. 14, 14 generations each. Likewise, these genealogies also recommend now. I'm not sure that if you want to go up the family tree, how many of us would like to go up and see an ape Sitting somewhere up there. <laughs> As a grandparent. As a, one of our ancestors. Ancestors there. I, mean, I, I would be happy about it. I would prefer this 
that we have a God who has created us and kept us safe. I would appreciate that. I mean, I would be proud of it. The people who bring up all these theories, I don't think they have any value for their ancestors, I guess. Or they, they have a very low esteem of their people who are there. But you look at this. God does it twice. I mean, through Moses in, uh, in Genesis. Any reason why I couldn't put those same genealogy twice? Because now when he talks in different places, when God talks in the Bible, when he, you know, there are people who look at the Old Testament differently, or the New Testament differently. In the present age, the New Testament is looked at separately. Old Testament is, is gone, done away with. But in the New Testament, God also talks about what happened is. When Jesus talks about it, he talks, he says, uh, what has been happening during his time, he used it for his own uh, uh, reference to the this thing. Maybe, uh, can you say, why did Jesus, how did Jesus affirm the biblical creation portion of it? In Matthew chapter 19, okay. verses 4 and 5, he does make a reference. 19 verses 4 and 5. And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, God has joined together, that no man separate. Well, that kind yes. of also, he talks about what happened during creation, creation time. Even in verse, Matthew chapter 24, verse 37 to 39, as in the days of Noah, so it will be the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. Jesus, back to Jesus himself is talking about what happened then. He's giving an evidence of that. Uh, what do you have anything to say about the, the Christians who talked? in the Bible about referring to creation, proving that creation was there. I mean, you're referring to the New Testament? Yes, in the New Testament, the Christians over there. Yes. If you see in First Peter chapter 3 and verse 20, and shall I read it? Read it. Just it far. says, who formerly were disobedient, when once a long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. Very interesting uh, here, in the book of Peter is talking about the long suffering of God during the days of Noah. So when you're going back to the days of Noah, that's in the first book of Genesis, talking about... Uh, and there's a long gap between all of this. A centuries. Centuries. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's talking definitely about that time. And if talking about uh, Noah, and a few centuries earlier was the creation. Creation. Even you'll go on to James chapter 3, verse 9. It says very interestingly, With the tongue we praise our Lord and our Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. It very interestingly points towards man being made in God's likeness, which was done in during creation, which God did, basically. I don't see anything to share Yeah, this. I have uh, Paul and Barnabas, when they healed this crippled man, mm -hmm. people began to run to them saying, look, gods have come among, among us. Okay. Let's go and worship them. Where is it from? Uh, this is found in Acts, Acts chapter 14, 14 verses 15. And yeah, it, it begins from there, yes. but I will be reading uh, verse 15. And saying, and saying, men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you. And preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God 
who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them. You know, here we see Paul and Barnabas giving, you know, the credit to God that he is the creator. Giving them a lesson. Giving them a lesson because they came around worshipping them. See, isn't it going against the paganism where they were telling, you know, anyone can become a god, anything can become a god. True. Sure. And here, these two point the thoughts back to the creator. Well, uh, I would like to say that modern science, you know, where you look at things, you want to see it, you test it, retest it, do anything. You want to go through that process of doing answer. You Sometimes we go, I would say, crazy in accepting some theories which are have no basis whatsoever. They remain a theory, but we accept it. There are people who accept it. But here we have a God who's provided us Bible, who's spoken through people. Now, Moses wrote this way after everything was done. The creation was early. Moses wrote this. God inspired him. God told him that. God did everything. The whole book, the Bible was inspired. And when we talk of the new Christians also talking about creation, they also refer to creation. It just proves that there was one thing evident in the whole thing, that creation happened. Yes. Everything else, what they talk about, the myths, never happened. Mrs. White very nicely says in, uh, in the quarterly, I have been shown that without Bible history, geology can prove nothing. Relics found in the earth do give evidence of a state of things differing in many respects from the present, but the time of their existence and how long appeared these things have been in the earth are only to be understood by Bible history. And the scriptures gives us all of this history. And the scripture, what we are learning this quarter, interpretation of the scripture, basically the scripture is showing us that we have something which happened, which is true, and we have a God who's living. We have a God who's mighty. The whole aim of the deviation of science is to attack God ultimately. And that's the main purpose. Well, it's our duty as members of the church to proclaim this, that we have a God who lives, a God who created us. And we have to live a life that could be a blessing to him. Shall we wind up with a little prayer? Uh, just give me a little prayer. Yeah. Let's pray. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for being with us throughout this discussion. And dear God, showing us through the scriptures that yes, science has evolved and people's thoughts have been drawn away from the truth. Dear God, help us so that we may all believe in the scriptures that yes, there was a creation and that you are the creator. Dear God, bless us each one so that we follow you and we honor and glorify your name in everything that we do. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. 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 Thank you guys for helping me out. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Happy Sabbath. Thank you. Thank you.